I'm Luke Kennedy with the McCain Institute, and you're in the arena with leaders and citizens who are taking character-based action. In the arena with us today, we have Ikram Sagal from Pakistan, and a tremendous honor to have you here with us uh, today. You're chairman of the Pathfinder Group, and you know, when I think of you, I think of security in a lot of ways. You're a security provider as a, as a businessman and run an enterprise that I'd like to, you know, explore and talk a little bit more about because it's, it's a very big and important enterprise. You're also a security analyst and an expert, and that extends to defense because you were uh, in the military and have had uh, very important experiences in the military. One shared with uh, Senator John McCain. You were both prisoners of war. We're going to get into that as well. But uh, thank you for being uh, in the arena, and uh, we appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Luke, for having me. Um, I, I think the start place I would like to, is it, it's a complicated world, as you well know, both from security, uh, defense, any way you want to look at it. Uh, Pakistan and, and the region around Pakistan is complicated. You don't need me to tell you that, but you're the expert on it. Um, you're an expert on that region and how it kind of connects to the world. Um, can you give us a sense of how it looks right now? Well, you know, uh, the world looks complicated when you look at it at this point of time because really you have so many players having so many different agendas there. But uh, if you really go down to it and understand, uh, it is not that world is not much different from anywhere else in the world. It is we who do not apply uh, simpler solutions to what is what seems to be complicated uh, problems. And uh, frankly speaking, I feel that uh, that particular uh, place has been used by other people. You know, I, I love to say this, General Pat, quote General Patton. You know, he said, no man ever won a war by dying for his country. Mm. He won a war by making the other SOB die for his country. Right. Right. So, I think what has happened there is that uh, Afghanistan has been used as a platform. First, it was used as a platform um, you know, different people had different agendas. By the Soviets, they came in and they had an agenda to get to the bomb waters in the Indian Ocean. And, of course, the free world took them on and they were defeated. Right? But during that time, uh, you know, the adjacent countries, particularly Pakistan, suffered because Pakistan came on the front line. That era elapsed and instead of uh, actually really uh, going through the full phase of the war, United States abruptly pulled out. And when abruptly pulling out, they left a vacuum there. And into that vacuum, a lot of, you know, let us say, adventurers sort of went into that vacuum, whether it's right. nations, individuals, etc. And in that gap, the, the Taliban took hold. You know, the Mujahideen, the factions, the Mujahideen, the nine factions, the Taliban were the strongest. And they coalesced together and they took hold and they took over control. And of course, they tried to bring their, their brand of extreme Islam in, which is not acceptable to the world. And then the second stage started after the 9-11. And 9, of course, was a horrific thing. And obviously, there had to be some retaliation. But I think, uh, really, uh, you know, that platform was used, really, by other interested countries. Right? So, this was a platform which I call it a fantastic platform for hybrid warfare mm. where you use yeah that's what i wanted to kind of get to do you think is hybrid you say things aren't so different is hybrid warfare represent something new absolutely because that is a war where the actual uh, uh, the actual people who are fighting the war you can never really they don't come into the forefront they use other people to fight the war in, in the 80s the uh, it was the soviet the russian lives russian money in, after the 9-11, it was American lives and American money being used, right, uh, to, for a uh, different purpose. And basically, uh, today, uh, you know, we proved right by the fact that uh, if you see uh, the United States pursuing talks with the Taliban, right, and which I think fairly successful, fairly successful, which 
which could have happened 20 years ago also, frankly speaking. Mm. But the, the te- talks with Taliban going very successful. But why? Because one particular country has been kept out of it. That the only country interested in keeping uh, Afghanistan aflame was India. And that was for their own purpose, because that could they could keep the war, the non-kinetic war. They used the kinetic war, which the Americans were fighting and the Afghans were fighting, and they fought their own non-kinetic war for themselves against Pakistan. Right. So, with the result that uh, you've had American lives, American money, Soviet lives, Soviet money, the beneficiary has been India all along. And Pakistan has been on the receiving end. Today, the world is changing. The, the people have come to realize, you know, the, the Americans have come to realize, the Soviets have come, the Russians have come to realize that, you know, we, we've been taken for a ride here, you know, and, and there now the things are getting better. And I think we are going to find a solution at the end of the day. So, complicated region, uh, players with uh, a lot of different uh, agendas to... to, to uh, to, to say the least, but you're also in the you're so you you keep on top of that, but you're also on the security provision side of it, right? So talk talk to us a little bit about. I mean, you're a businessman at the end of the day, but you provide and a f- philanthropist, but you're providing security. How do you approach that in this environment? Is it easier nowadays? Uh, more difficult? Far more difficult. Uh, it's far more difficult because in the in the olden days we just used to look put a guard there and expect somebody to come and attack you and you, you had trained the guard to do that. Now it's not that because it's he, the, anybody who's going to come at you is not going to come just uh, uh, by uh, by kinetic means. He's going to come at nine con- uh, non-kinetic means. He's going to come to you through propaganda. He's going to come through you through electronic means. He's going to use uh, you know, f- fake, um, uh, distorted views. So the whole information domain Absolutely. in the security business, you've had to take it into account. The way uh, you've you- got to take into account that your people, everybody carries a telephone. Right. And, you know, in the telephone, you just have to insert a false message into the telephone, right? And you'll have different reactions from different people. So you have to be very careful how to counter that in real time, right? So the, the nature of the uh, security business has changed, right? In, in fact, you know, I just want to apprise you, because of that, what we did was, we, we have a security services division, but about four or five years ago, we opened up a financial uh, services and technology division, mm. basically to cover technology, to cover this aspect, uh, that, you know, where the, where, you know, uh, where, where uh, the money can be used, where, uh, you know, you can, uh, the financial, uh, this thing is, persons could be actually robbed of their entire savings with the electronic means, right? You know, so we uh, we we went into that uh, cyber threats and things like that. I bet people have sought you out for that sort of protection. Well, not only really that, we, we um, frankly speaking, we, we made a business out of our dream, you know, which is which is good. You know, <laughs> if you can do two things at one time. <laughs> well, uh, it just yeah, I guess we should go back a little bit to what got you into the security business. So you were an army officer in Pakistan, is that correct? Yes. Uh, and uh, we'll t- talk a little bit about your service. Well, you know, um, basically, I was my father was infantry. I was infantry, right? And I went into aviation for some time. Did a stint of two and a half years flying aircraft. Yeah. But I came back, and you know, we, we were brought up on the British regimental tradition. Right. Where the you know man. I, I work for a, a British general in Afghanistan, and he would come back uh, from Pakistan. And I hope I can say this. And he would say, "Gosh, they're more British than the British." Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they're, they're military nowadays. And you know, you would have uh, people come into you, and they were long-lasting uh, relationships, etc. So when I left the army and I came into business, I was doing pretty well, doing counter trade and other stuff like that. And people from my regiment would come and land up in my garage, and you know, they'd give, give, give us a job. Right. So one day I said, what the hell? Let me try and get me uh, and some. So I started the private security services business to actually absorb jobs. And that became a success because we, we, were, we, were, we formed a small team, right? And, and that team was very good and, uh, in the sense. And we soon got the American uh, uh, contract for the embassies. And today... That's a pretty big deal, I would say. a pretty <laughs> big deal. And, uh, you know, we've had this uninterrupted uh, run of 31 years wow. guarding the American contract. And it is the largest manpower contract in the world. We have 2,700 guards guarding American uh, property, 
the American lives, American institutions, etc., all over Pakistan in four different. Yeah, museums. I didn't know that. I suspect not too many people. Not know many that. People that know is that. a big enterprise. That, that is uh, absolutely, and because of that, obviously, we learned on the job. You know, we had these um, uh, diplomatic security service people, the mobile training teams coming on uh, and training our people. We to yeah, stay ahead. It of takes a partnership to do this. Right? Absolutely, I mean, it's not. Yeah, and we were very lucky. We very early. I have a partner here, a company called Taurus, and uh, basically Jerry Taurus. You know, Jerry, myself hit it off very well, and you know, so we formed a very balanced relationship. He would, uh, you know, provide all the technical side and center. We would do the thing. He would, he would, you know, look after all the other things. We would be the people on the ground in Pakistan. He would make sure that we were our people were trained enough. We had the logistic support, etc. So, so I think that worked out has worked out very well. Gosh, thirty-one years and 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 going strong, but you you skipped over. I think what's a pretty important part of your service, and, I, and I, this this book gets at it. And I get you know, you're not going to be able to go into everything that's in in the book, but but you were uh, a prisoner of war. Yes, I was. And and why, you know, I'm going to draw too uh, big a distinction here, but but I think you were a prisoner of war about the same time Senator John McCain was a prisoner of war, and both of you have gone on to absolutely on to really long uh, careers. Do I have that right? I mean, is that there's there's a connection there? There is a connection, and I think that was the connection that sort of drew us together. Of course, you know, I stayed. I, I mean, he was a considerable length of time, and his is an amazing story, his endurance and his courage, and you know, I was far luckier. I escaped on the hundredth day. I was 99 days in prison, prison and 100 days, and um, uh, that sort of, and I was the first Pakistani prisoner of war uh, to ever escape in history from India. So that sort of, uh, uh, that, uh, sort of, uh, etc. But I mean, it's a long story, and of course, I'll give you a book, and I hope you get right. to read it. Right. Well, I am going to read it. I'm going to read it. Yeah. And but uh, you know, I was very lucky. Um, just to give you a little background, I was lucky because I was I had. Uh, very, I was uh, very privileged to have very good, uh, um, let us say, grounding right in the very beginning of my life. And from the, between the ages of seven and eleven, I was brought up in a Catholic convent where a Texas nun as a good Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> now run that by me again. Now that, 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 I'm was, not sure I completely caught up to that. <laughs> I was, I said, I was brought up uh, by a uh, Texas nun yep. in a Catholic convent as a good Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty unique. You need to write another book just on that. <laughs> well, I, I, um, you know, I today, um, I look and I'm very, I'm very proud to say this, that in the name of Sister Leo, Sister Mary Leo, um, you know, I, my company on Sundays guards 125 Christian churches for the last 25 years, free of cost on Sundays. Right. We do that. And uh, and we uh, we've done that, and therefore you find that you know unlike in Sri Lanka where they had an easy run, in Pakistan if they come up against us, you know they will first they will find that uh, you know we've been there, and till today we haven't lost a single person in the 25 years. I'm struck, you know, I, I, I need to read your books. I'm, I'm delinquent. I need to catch up to your book. But uh, I've, I've certainly read uh, Senator McCain's book, and character is destiny. And uh, I'm struck by uh, uh, the things you're talking about here. I, I sense character and strength of character in that. I, I maybe sound like I'm pandering, but it's it's action and it's 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 courage. It seems at the at the core of uh, of, of how you go about your your business. Do I have that right? Well, you know, I uh, this lady, uh, she was amazing. She just instilled things into me. And when you are between seven and eleven, you are at a very impressionable age, right? And she just just I think she she probably I was probably the son she never had. Right, and so she put her heart and soul into me, and a lot of things that I write today, and I write a weekly column, which is not many businessmen do in the world. I, I right. believe I'm the only one of the few people who write a weekly column as a businessman and I get away with it. 
like my son says, I get away with it. <laughs> but the, but uh, the, the fact is that uh, I do feel that she had a lot to do with whatever I am today. And, uh, you know, I owe it to her. I've, one of my books I've dedicated to her, you know, and uh, so, and, you know, and I, I must tell you that when my son was going to college and for the first time I, I, I came out to Boston and she drove about 110 miles. She was old at that time, but she drove mm. to see me. And we were talking to each other for an hour or so with my son, we were talking to the other people. And when they went away, my son told me, he said, now I know who your real mother is. <laughs> that's, that's strong. That's very, very strong. Now, I have read some of your columns. I'm a little behind on your book. Well, you just gave me the book. It's not as easy to track down. I should have tracked it down. But you, you wrote a column fairly recently that says you think that the, the prime minister of New Zealand should get a Nobel Prize uh, for how she handled that. Uh, tell me a little bit more about that and then you know, that's, it's, it was a, a horrible instance of, uh, of, of, of terrorism and hate and extremism and, and play there. You know, um, something like that happens. And you can go any number of directions from there. Right? But the profound thing that happened there was the instinctive leadership that he provided. First thing, a leader has to be seen. right? And she made herself seen at the scene of uh, the incident soon afterwards. Right. She showed sympathy. And she showed sympathy by symbolically, by wearing a headscarf. Well, I'm sure she doesn't want to wear a hijab all her life. But <laughs> right. the, the point is that she showed that to, to start with, it did a number of things. It first of all, uh, gave a lot of confidence to the Muslim community. Number one. Number two, it brought the a great silent majority among the New Zealand people, you know, to the to uh, to back her, right? Mm. And she kept at it. She went to Parliament, passed gun laws, right? And would you be able to pass a gun law in, in uh, United States in in a week's time, right? We, we just haven't been able to do it. We haven't. No, <laughs> for We're years. Not even, we haven't. Even, no, right, right for different reasons. But the point is that she did. Th she's done things which I think were really out of the ordinary, right? And I think that, and, and this is a young lady, she's not old, she's the youngest, um, I think, female prime minister ever. I, I think she may be the youngest prime minister ever. But the point is that she, uh, you know, she went and made herself felt that where she had to be. And because of that, I think because of that, she aroused a lot of good feeling in the world, which is there. You know, these extremists. They, they take hold of you because they're, they're virulent, uh, you know, they're vocal and they're virulent and beca because they, can, they're, they're, you know, they, they think that they can then ride over you because of the strength of uh, their, you know, their uh, uh, brutal actions. Right. That's the very nature of terrorism, terrorism to terrorize yeah. you. Yeah. Terrorize you. But here she was. She acted as, a, you know, to that thing, etc. And the reaction you know, from the people were very positive, you know, and I think that by itself shows that if you want, you know, you, what is a Nobel Peace Prize? Nobel Peace Prize is meant for you to have something distinctive to make sure that something is there that changes the destiny of people. I think by her action, she changed the destiny of New Zealand for the better. Right. You know? So I think that by itself, New Zealand may not know it today, but 20 years or 30 years later, that will come as a defining moment. You know, New Zealand, that thing is that where she, uh, you know, um, she stepped out and made sure that her presence had an impact on what was going to happen on the present and the future. I think kind of recognizing uh, leadership and character-driven uh, leadership and, and consequences and integrity is, uh, is important. That is exactly, I mean, I want to bring you back to John McCain. Yep. You know, throughout, we found a constant stream in John McCain. It's constant threat in John McCain, whether it was his his um, uh, let us say behavior as a prisoner of war, right when he stood his ground, right, and where he could have many times come back. He was the son of an admiral. They they, they in fact offered to uh, release him, right. right. But he said no, I will not go back to the last the thing. He suffered indignities, suffered torture, he suffered the thing, etc. You know, and 
uh, with the result that in, in many cases he uh, this physical disablement lasted him throughout his life but he stood his ground on his principles right and that i think is uh, th- that defined the american character you know that that i i uh, my uh, sense of americans is uh, the character of the american is fair play the par- character of the uh, american character is described by fair play and fair play uh, describes to you a lot of other things integrity honesty you know strength of character etc the fair play comes into it right so i think that particular thing of john mccain was very endearing what's your advice for the next generation of leaders here pakistan wherever you choose to the next generation of leaders must have a perception clear perception of what uh, their uh, that the people want right and they must be able if the people want something which may affect them adversely in the long run they must have the courage to stand up and make sure they take them on the right direction right you cannot be led by your people you know if you want to lead your people you have to make them follow you right and and that is the essence of it all you cannot be you cannot be led by public opinions right, right. you know you cannot be led by polls right and polls can be wrong as we know right so we, I, i think that by itself is a great thing and particularly in this modern world where everything is instantaneous where the social media is used as a weapon you right so at that point of time i think you need to be ahead of the curve and that particular thing that you need to lead from the front you've got to and you've got to show uh, personal character you've got to show that in adverse circumstances you've got to show to your people that you are a uh, part and parcel of them and yet you can you know define the ways that they have to go in order for them to have a prosperous future and a peaceful future So we started this interview at least in part about uh, uh, tracing a little bit of the complexity or of the security environment and providing security. Um, do you see a next generation of leaders embracing security provision? Is there someone out there like uh, you that's going to be uh, starting and carrying forward for 30, 40 years with uh, security provision in companies? Because it's more complicated. I mean, do you see that? I, I think there is no other choice for them. in the present environment where uh, security has uh, the, uh, the security can be subverted at lightning speed for them to have anything else but to do anything that they have to do without keeping uh, an, you know a, a, let us say an eye open or a ear open for security would be disastrous for them and disastrous for the people that they, the constituencies that they sort of lead because they need to understand that uh, that is one thing that can derail all your future you know you can be the best economist in the world you can be the best engineer in the world you can be the best uh, let us say visionary in the world but if you have m- maybe even non state actors come and derail your uh, dreams into nightmares you will have problems so you have to keep a, a, a you have to be security minded even as you are uh, being democratic minded Ikram Sagal, we really appreciate you being in the arena. We know we're going to uh, keep going, and it's, uh, it's, 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 it's fantastic to have you here. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you very much. Yep. This podcast is produced by Patrick McCann and Justin Kessler. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, tell your friends, or leave a review.